So Rudy, you're, you're taking the lead, right? Yes, sir. So okay. let's Fantastic. go ahead and kick it off. My name is Rudy Martin. I'm the Vice President of Business Development for Money and Restoration, Painting and Waterproofing. Um, we've been in business over 60 years. Uh, I reached out to Jessica with Sherman Williams. I said, let's put a great team together. I've got some great content. And um, I really want to get this information out there because when I'm out in the field, I see so many project managers that let their building get in disarray because they didn't notice the telltale signs of their building talking to them. And it's actually going to have to cost them more money and more time. And so we wanted to create this course to make sure that everyone understood that they can inspect their building, they can find problem areas, and then they can solve them. Um, we're going to open it up to the panelists at the end. Um, we're going to great, get great insight from uh, lawyers, from engineers, from um, project managers on how to identify, how to tackle some common issues, some best practices. So I'll go ahead and introduce Andy Schrader. He's our in-house engineer. Andy is special in his own right. He's absolutely brilliant. He's also pretty funny. And he's also on the task force for the emergency relief. I'm probably not saying any of this right, but every time a hurricane blows through, Andy assists the firefighters in inspecting buildings to make sure structurally they're sound, they're able to go in, things like that. So we're glad to have Andy presenting. Um, I'll reach out to DSS first, if James or uh, Kelly want to introduce themselves um, and uh, talk briefly about their company before we get started. Sure, absolutely. <clears throat> uh, Kelly, you mind if I jump in? Fantastic. Hello. All right, well, thanks for having us. We really appreciate it. We're glad to be part of this, um, uh, this webinar. Um, we're DSS Condo, and we are an owner's representative project management firm that specializes in condominium project management, which means basically all we do is manage large-scale construction projects on behalf of associations. Uh, we developed that niche over the years, uh, and we, we've, we started out in the commercial industry with DSS. DSS Condo is the sister company to DSS, and again, was born um, with the sole purpose and thought in mind of, of managing these condominium restoration, repair, and beautification projects. Um, the DSS Condo entity has been in business for about, uh, maybe about six years now, and the commercial side of the company has been in business for about 15 years. Um, we have a, a, a team of, of construction professionals, uh, educated and, and experienced in architecture, engineering, and construction. Um, that's our go-to when it comes to building our staff. And, um, you know, we love what we do. And, um, you know, we, we're here to service these condominium communities. We understand they're a unique community. They're unique in the sense of, of the um, the, the structure and, and, and how they must uh, look at and, and approach these projects. So, uh, you know, we, we, uh, we love what we do. And Kelly, if you want to add anything, feel free to do so. For owners reps, we represent just ownership, which is the community owners of the condominiums. And uh, like James said, everybody comes to work. We all love what we do and we love taking care of our clients. So we're we really appreciate Rudy and the gang uh, inviting us to be part of this panel. Thank you. Um, turn it over to uh, Ben at um, City Quiet. Am I pronouncing that right, Ben? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, good morning. My name is uh, Ben Friedman from City Quiet Windows and Doors. Uh, first and foremost, I wanted to thank everybody uh, for coming to the meeting this morning. I wanted to thank the team. Uh, from Munyon and um, those of which that have contributed to putting this event together, um, for putting this all together and the attendees for coming. Um, City Quiet Windows is a full service turnkey window and door company uh, located here in South Florida. Uh, we've been in business for about 25 years, specializing in high rise condominium window and door replacement. Um, all of our windows and doors that we install are all Miami Dade certified as well as um, state of Florida, uh, Florida building code approved. Um, we don't use any subcontractors. All of our technicians are in house um, and uh, we're licensed, we're insured and bonded. And uh, we look forward to answering any questions that anybody has with regard to windows and doors. Excellent, thank you. Um, forgive me if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly. Sin Sinasai from Falcon Group? Not even close? 
No, it's relatively good. You made me a little bit more exotic than I really am, but... You're welcome. It, it, you know, it, it works. It works for me. So, uh, to try to pronounce my own name correctly, my name is Sinisha, or if United States, Sinisa Kohler. I'm the executive vice president of the Falcon Group. Uh, Falcon Group is the full... Uh, 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 a blown uh, engineering consulting company assisting condo uh, and HOAs uh, uh, throughout the South Florida. Our, our sole uh, business is basically working with condo associations and HOAs throughout the life of one uh, association, uh, starting with a turnover when the building is just built, uh, all the way to the 40, 50, 60 year restifications if you live in. Uh, Miami-Dade or, or Broward County and everything in between, inclusive of roof replacements, uh, waterproofing replacements, exterior restoration, uh, uh, painting, uh, also involved with uh, uh, litigation support, God forbid you need some and, and things like that. So our, our, our core business is that we uh, uh, are trying to assist the associations with any engineering needs they might have throughout the life of that association. We have all our engineers on staff, structural, civil, architects, plumbing, mechanical, electrical. So we are fully equipped to assist with the most common needs of one association throughout the, the life of the building. Uh, I would like to thank the Manion Painting for having us on this panel and also all the other panelists for uh, you know, participating in this. And hopefully we can all together jointly provide valuable information to uh, all attendees so they can take care of their buildings better and hopefully without, uh, we, without less of our involvement throughout the life of the building, because if you see all of us on your building uh, together, may be that you are too late in what we are trying to do today. So thank you very much. Thank you. Robert, we're at WRG. Good morning. Uh, thank you again for the invite. I'm looking forward to this. I believe it'll be a pleasure. Um, I'm Robert Lozano with the, the Vice President of the Water Restoration Group. Uh, and a Florida licensed asbestos contractor. Uh, we perform emergency uh, response services for water, fire, smoke, mold, and when planned appropriately, asbestos removal projects. Uh, we do cover uh, the Tri-County area. Um, we pride ourselves in doing uh, quality work uh, at a competitive, fair price. Um, we, we prefer to plan and uh, be prepared and aware for projects that are coming up, but sometimes when emergencies happen, we respond to them. And um, again, we've been in business for, for a number of years and we're hoping to continue doing so and offer quality work and, uh, and look forward to working with professionals. Thank you very much. Now, it's usually ladies first where I come from, but because she's a co-host, I wanted to save the best for last. Uh, Jessica with Sherman Williams. Um. Hi, good morning. My name is Jessica. I work for Sherry Williams. Um, we are a manufacturer over 150 years of experience and success. Sherry Williams offer proven solutions created especially for homeowners, property managers, and more. Every step of the way, Sherry Williams can help you, guide you, and in every aspect of your project with any contractor. And, and I appreciate Monja contacting me, and we always working together and we are looking forward to do more web seminar like this and having more patterns like you guys. Thank you for coming. Excellent. Jonathan is our tech genius. Uh, he works at Vinium. He does a great job setting everything up, preparing the market material. Um, this is recorded and it will be posted on their YouTube channel. You can also ask for a recording so people can reference this later if they want. Um, so Jonathan, please, uh, without further ado. Yeah, thank you very much and, and pleasure to, uh, to put these together. Uh, everybody did a fantastic job of, of letting their market and, and network know uh, about these uh, fantastic webinars that uh, we're putting together. So thanks for that. Um, so I work with Vintium. We are a full service communication software suite. Uh, we provide personalized community websites and company websites for management companies uh, and provide all of that communication, whether that's from, you know, email, notices, SMS, voice messages, which is when we'll take a paragraph of text, convert that into an audio format and actually call residents individually on their landline, cell phone, office line, that sort of thing. Um, we've got document storage, we've got virtual meetings, we've got, um, things to track uh, um, work orders. We've got a, a social network. We've got a ton of different communication-based features for your community. Uh, and we're actually launching a new virtual meeting tool, uh, partnering with Zoom, 
uh, and leveraging the, the power there with the video conference uh, to put together your uh, annual, gen annual general meetings, uh, committee meetings, board meetings, that sort of stuff, uh, making it easy to uh, sit down with everybody, uh, physically distanced, and make decisions right here uh, in the system uh, while still populating minutes and agendas and that sort of stuff. Um, so that's Vintim in a nutshell. If you've got any questions, feel free to reach out. Thanks, Rudy. Thank you very much. Andy, it's the Andy Show. Good morning, guys. Uh, thanks very much for, for having me out here. And uh, Rudy, I'll be listening for you to chime in um, while I'm talking. I, I can't always see chat or people have questions. So if they do, just go ahead and um, <clears throat> call them out to me. <coughs> um, let's see here. I have to share my screen with you guys. So let me make sure that's going. How's that looking? Can you guys see my, my Munion slide? We can. Perfect. Okay, we'll go ahead and jump in. <clears throat> uh, today's guide is a Community Association Manager's Guide to uh, Structural Property Inspections. Um, we're talking about how to visually inspect for deficiencies, how to anticipate issues before they show up. Um, most importantly, we want to improve your, DS, your BS contractor when talking to scumbag contractors like myself. So we're trying to give you guys a leg up on it, potential issues with your buildings before they happen. And a lot of this stuff is, um, it's Florida. We see the same type of construction over and over and over again. And so once you recognize the type of construction, oftentimes you can recognize what issues to anticipate and, and kind of address them before they get too, uh, too bad. Um, some of my qualifications, I, I am a structural engineer by trade. I have my bachelor's and master's degrees in civil structural engineering. Uh, so I'm a, I'm a licensed PE and I work as a special inspector of threshold buildings. I worked as a consulting engineer before uh, joining the dark side and be, you know, becoming a terrible person and contractor like we talked about. So that's me and I am broadcasting from the Millennium Falcon today as, as homage. What do I do um, in my spare time? I, I work for the uh, state of Florida's Urban Search and Rescue Task Force. Um, so I basically, as Rudy said, I, I go out for the hurricanes and uh, on rescue missions, helping firefighters figure out how to get into buildings and get out and get people out of there. I've, I've been deployed for the last four years. I thought I was going to be deployed this week for Hurricane Sally. I thought I was going to have to um, have Rudy lead the show here, but thankfully they let me stay home. Um, I've worked as the official roofing consultant for the Pinellas County Housing Authority. So I've inspected a couple thousand roofs in my lifetime and um, I know a thing or two about them hope to share some of those with you today three main parts of uh, what we're looking at today uh, t talking about okay what do we see in typical construction in Florida that's gonna be part one part two we kind of get into the nitty-gritty of inspections and what I personally think about when I'm when I'm looking at things how, how it goes and then part three we'll look at some real-world examples and some parting thoughts and then a surprise pop quiz that you haven't heard about yet go ahead and get into it Typical Florida construction types. Um, so we usually have a lot of questions on this um, on this presentation. I like that. I love that. So please go ahead and, and chat and, and message your your comments and questions. And if, if Rudy sees something, he'll call it out. So this is part one where I'd like somebody to, to comment here if they can. We see one of our most commonly observed construction types. It's called RC, and it stands for something. And I'd like if someone can tell me what that stands for. And uh, the other engineer that's on the board here, you, you don't count. You can't chime in. <laughs> so it's called construction type of RC. So hoping somebody can tell me what RC stands for. Here's another view of it. And here's our last view of it. So we got any hits yet, Rudy? No one cares. <sighs> nobody, you nobody guys. knows. You guys. Dumped them all. Yeah, right. A oh, restoration, um, construction, reinforced concrete. Hey, reinforced concrete. Who said that? Great job, whoever whoever you are. That, and thank you for answering. And thank you for caring enough to comment. Uh, stands for reinforced concrete. And what do we reinforce concrete with? We'll, we'll look at that in a second. Um, when we first started getting big with reinforced concrete in the 1960s, 1970s, started becoming huge along the coast in Florida. You know, yes, it's typically more expensive than wood frame, but hey, it lasts forever, right? We look at the Roman Colosseum, 2,000 years later, that's still around. Um, when we're looking at moisture intrusion and water, we call reinforced concrete more of a mass storage system. A reinforced concrete and concrete block can hold a certain amount of water inside it and, and still sometimes be okay versus a wood frame structure that if it gets a leak, it's going to deteriorate the wood very quickly. So 
talked about reinforced concrete. They said it lasts forever. Look at the Coliseum. And then, okay, second question here, if somebody can chime in. We said concrete lasts forever. What is the difference between how the Romans constructed their buildings and what we use today? So we both use concrete. We both use uh, a lot of the same building blocks, but we put something different in our concrete that the Romans did not use. Can somebody tell me what that is? Ooh, I see a comment. Rebar, steel. That's right, rebar, steel. Great job, guys. Um, this is the, the primary difference. This is why we don't have to use arches. So we, we don't have to build with arches like the Romans did because we use reinforcing steel to take up some of that tensile, uh, tensile requirement. And basically it, steel, it can, it can stretch, it can elongate. And that's, this is what we use that's different. So we can see green bars here. Those are coated with an, an epoxy type coating to help them from rusting. Um, here's another example. So you can see there's actually a whole lot of steel inside of most of our reinforced concrete buildings. So this is the big difference to what, what we did and what the Romans did. And for you folks who have been living in a reinforced concrete building that's more than about 20, 30 years old, you, you've, this might be a familiar site. We can see that in fact, the concrete, the concrete itself lasts forever, but the reinforcing steel itself, it rusts and it corrodes. And when it corrodes, it expands. And we talked about how steel can, steel can stretch. Well, concrete cannot stretch. Concrete will crack and it falls. And this is the end result of what we see when long-term steel corrosion has set in. So that's reinforced concrete. That's uh, what we look at there. This, now let's talk about another type we often see, which is a veneer type of construction. Veneer mean what you see on the outside is not what it actually looks like on the inside. So we, we can see probably a stucco over wood frame building here. And we can see that the, the wood framing is covered up by these different things. So we have OSB sheathing over it, or plywood or OSB. We have house wrap over it. And then on the outside of that, we would have stucco. So wood frame is, is called a veneer system. Metal frame, as shown here, is also a type of veneer system. Siding, same deal. Okay, so we, we talked about the, the most common types that we see here. We see reinforced concrete systems, we see block wall um, uh, walls, and then we see the, those types of walls there. So exterior finishes is another big question. Um, this is what we see a lot of in Florida. We see stucco. We can see three coats here, the scratch coat, the brown coat, and, the, and basically the, the finish coat there. And that's over wire lath, and it, it's over those things that you see there. Here's another view of a, of a stucco type system. So we can see it's a multi-coat system and that's, that's over your, your weatherproofing barriers and it's over your wood studs. The Florida Building Code uh, defines stucco very specifically. It has to be the certain thickness, which is seven eighths of an inch thick. Now, um, seven eighths of an inch thick, that's almost an inch, that's very thick. Anyone who has pretty much ever cut into your buildings, if you've ever had to do thickness tests on your stucco, you've probably seen, oh crap, it's not actually seven eighths of an inch thick. And it's actually very rare to encounter stucco in the field that, that has been built that thick according to the Florida Building Code. Um, we talked about how stucco has scratch coats, brown coats, and finish coats. And stucco is what we call a cementitious material. So it's cement-like. It cracks easily, it cannot flex. It doesn't have any movement or flexibility built in. When it has to move, it cracks. And that, that's what allows it to, to actually take on that expansion or contraction um, as, it, as it goes through its life cycle. So we also have stucco in quotation marks and you know stucco, we can call it cementitious coating. And in cases where, where stucco is over concrete block, it does not have to be as thick. So that seven eighths of an inch thick thing, that is, is when it stucco is over frame, it does not apply over concrete block. So this would be an example of that. So we have two primary things that our exterior walls are made of in Florida. It might be frame wall, it might be a concrete block wall like this. When it's stucco over a frame structure, it is supposed to be seven eighths of an inch thick. When it's uh, over block like this, it can be half inch thick. So we keep that in mind. Uh, here's one of my cats, so that's good. Helps keep me awake during my own lectures. <laughs> Rudy, do we have any questions so far? We don't have any questions so far, and I would encourage anybody, if you have any questions, please feel free to put it in the chat, and we'll get them answered. Thanks very much, and thanks, Kitty, for uh, waking us all up. 
So we've talked about, okay, what do we normally see on exterior walls and what do we normally put on them? Things like stucco. How do we finish off that stucco? Um, stucco in itself is not inherently waterproof. So normally the stucco has to be waterproofed at some point. Um, the uh, uh, Sinesha pointed out that, you know, he looks at turnover studies of buildings or when buildings are turned over from the association. So normally when a contractor builds a condo and turns it over to the association, the stucco has been painted with a very thin, relatively thin coating, two to three mils thick. Um, a mil is 0 0.001 inches. So that's obviously a very thin coating. So normally during an association's first paint job after turnover, it's time to waterproof that stucco. And that's when you would apply more of a waterproof or weatherproof coating, which is gonna be somewhere in the neighborhood of 16 to 20 mils thick. So that, that kind of gives you a reference there. And do we say, do developers have to waterproof? Um, the building code is a little bit vague on this when it comes to our exterior walls and, and stucco over wood frame. It, you know, it basically says they must provide weatherproofing, but it doesn't lay down the specifics of exactly what they have to do. Uh, not quite like they do in the same way when they specify roofs and things like that. It's gotten better over time, but generally speaking, if you have a stucco over wood frame building, it probably has not been effectively waterproofed by the original developer who developed that condo. Some of the, uh, the paint coatings that we see on these areas, uh, we use the terms acrylic and latex interchangeably. Generally, they, they kind of mean the same thing. We're talking about the same thing when we're saying acrylic paint or latex paint. High build acrylics are what I personally like to see most. So when I'm talking to my manufacturers, whether it's, it's Sherwin-Williams, PPG, Porter, whoever, um, I ask them to, to look at putting a high build acrylic on that, on that building. High build just means it's a thicker coating so you can build it up. And the advantage of these high build acrylics are that they can provide weatherproofing or waterproofing functions, but they're also breathable. So for any of you condo managers that have condos that were built in the 70s, they have a lot of elastomeric coatings and you've probably seen water balloons on the side of your building. Um, that's kind of a, a bad side effect of what happens when water gets behind elastomeric coatings. A high build acrylic coating does not generally have that problem. So moisture can escape from the walls. It doesn't build up. It doesn't create water balloons, but it still keeps wind driven rain from getting into the building. Hey, Andy. Yes. So Scott's been a manager for over 20 years. He's had some faulty paint projects. He's had three high rise buildings that was painted. Uh, it's so important to have a responsible painting supplier um, inspect the job and the contractor doing the job. Um, he gets annual roof inspections. How come he can't get a paint supplier to do the same? Jessica, you might um, feel free to jump in on this if you if you want um but uh oh yes another question here who's going to qualify the application would be done with a pull test paint supplier time of the application so a couple questions here number one during the normal process we have checks and balances that's why we have en en engineers that's why we have project managers that's why they're on this call that's why we have vendor representatives um a painting company like myself i'm just an applicator so i'll lean on sherman williams to write the specification Sherman Williams in the, the projects that we do, they come out at every phase. They come out when we're doing the pressure clean, when we're doing the priming, when we're doing the painting, um, they'll have mill gauges, they'll inspect to make sure that the millage is correct. Um, Jessica, do you usually do an annual inspection or once it is complete, um, do you just leave it, you know, to be whatever the shelf life is of the paint, seven, 10, 15 years of whatever it is? And I don't know if Jessica's on or if she stepped away. But so Andy, the, qu the question is to you is when a, when a building is painted, should it get an annual inspection from the paint supplier or the contractor? So I, I can answer part of that. Um, generally speaking, with roof areas, uh, there is a cost for the, for the manufacturer to obtain that warranty. So when the, sorry, for the contractor to obtain that warranty. So if I'm a contractor and I, if I apply a new roof or if I use a liquid applied coating on a new roof, I have to pay the manufacturer a certain dollar amount for that warranty. Part of that price will normally include yearly inspections from the manufacturer. It is very rare. I, I've never personally heard of a, of a paint manufacturer uh, putting yearly inspections on a building after the building has been installed. Is it an awesome idea? Yeah, great. That's why we want to develop relationships with our paint reps. But um, you know, I would be more inclined to hire someone like Sanisha to come out and take a look. 
and uh, basically, Sinisha, you know, doesn't know who the contractor is, doesn't care. He just wants, you know, he's working for the client, uh, sorry, the condo at that point, and you know, can can provide these inspections. Um, one thing you want to be careful about is, you know, we we say, yeah, Sherwin Williams is going to provide, you know, inspections during the project. Well. If I am a, a, a huge painting contractor, Sherwin Williams really wants to maintain that relationship with me, right? So they they will be very careful to choose their words carefully and you know try not to throw me under the bus, because whether it's Sherwin Williams, whether it's PPG, whoever the manufacturer is, if they were to throw me the bus on, under one project, do you really think as a manufacturer I'm going to you know choose them on the next project? So th there are relationships there that as as condo association people you know you want to be be made aware of um with an engineer doing the inspections that's a lot that's less likely to occur but there's you know there's there's still a possibility um that's why generally we we like to see um design professionals such as engineers and architects doing doing their own inspections on jobs hey andy um, are we going to get into that's a great answer um are we going to get into post-tension rebar at any point in this conversation or should we hold that to the end Let's hold that until the end. Okay. Um, we, uh, I, Jared, I, I'm going to hold that to the. Uh, no, it wasn't Jared. It was. Um, what was I asked about that? Daryl, I'm going to hold that to the end, and I'll make a note. Um, one other question: When paint is applied over paint, there's an adhesion test. Who's responsible for that adhesion test? Is it the contractor, or is it the, the paint manufacturer, or is it, or is it the engineer or the project manager? The answer is it depends. It depends on how your contract documents were written and what they what they actually specify. It may be one entity, it may be both. So it, it completely depends on, on how your contract documents are written out. And I have certain... a question about stucco and cracks. I'm also gonna hold that to the end because I know that you're gonna be covering that. Okay. So Jared, and, hold on and I'll get your question answered. And uh, just, just regarding, you know, who's responsible for the inspections, sometimes the manufacturer, whether it's, whether it's PPG, whether it's Florida Paints, whoever, will, will write in their documentation for the, the contractor and say, hey, these certain inspections have to be called at, cer at certain times. So it's prudent for the community association manager to check up on that and say, okay, what inspections are required from the paint manufacturer, if any? And Mr. Contractor, what are you going to do as far as inspections during this project? Jessica, can you walk us really quick through the process of inspection during a paint or repaint? Yes, so um, when we, we, when the property manager signed the contract, even with the um, contractor or with the engineer, both to, to, to go and repaint, um, specifications and then we go we have all our sales rep in different areas um, they go and do the job walks and start taking pictures and seeing uh, how the, the the contractor the painters are applying our paint um, going through that is a good thing so if we see something different like um, uh, to our spec that's the moment that we talk with the property manager with the contractor to try to figure out how we we can um, um, uh, address that situation or that issue. Thank you. Great conversation. Great question, guys. Keep them coming. Andy, let's keep up the pace, bud. We're talking about how do we, when we're look, walking up to a building, how do we tell what type of coating it is? Um, if it's an elastomeric coating, it will feel very smooth to the touch. It'll feel pliable. Um, you can usually peel it off. If, if there is a little water balloon, you can actually peel that, building, uh, that coating off and it will come off in a sheet. Um, acrylic coating, by contrast, is is more hard. It's um, it will not just peel off; it will will flake off in certain times. So, once you've seen an elastomeric coating, if if you can rub your fingers on it, you'll you'll always remember that, and you can tell what it looks like whenever you look up to it. So, we've looked at what do we normally see for our walls? What do we see oftentimes on our exterior finishes? Going to talk about a little bit about roofing and um, what types of things we see. Metal roof systems, awesome. Uh, very expensive. They last a long time. It's pretty rare for them to have issues. Um, flat roof systems, such as a, a mod bit asphalt sheet that we see here. So this is very common for our, for our larger condominiums. Uh, here's a guy putting, he's putting down the old school uh, hot mop tar. So we, we now we use a, a better system called a torch down system for most of these applications. But here's what it looks like. It's hot, it's stinky, 
you don't want that. <laughs> um, sloped roof systems, asphalt shingle roofs. So we, we call that we would call this a steep slope roof as opposed to a low slope system like the uh, like the flat deal there. This is kind of the old school roofing components for wood frame structures. So we can see rafters, which it's kind of rare to see rafters now. We we see plywood sheathing, we see roofing felt on top of that, and then and then we see shingles. So I'm going to ask you guys to comment. You can get your get your fingers ready to comment. We see roofing felt in this photo, but it's kind of rare to see roofing felt these days. We've replaced roofing felt with a, a newer and, and kind of better product. Can can somebody tell me what that product is that's that's replaced roofing felt? Anybody have a guess? Present engineers excluded. I see some comments there. Mason Water Shield. Uh, Ryan says peel and stick. Jared. It's a plastic sheeting gate or something. Elena who was said, that? Who was that said peel and stick? That was Ryan. That was uh, Jared. Jared, my man. Good job. Um, Jared, great job. You win absolutely nothing. <laughs> hey, he wins my gratitude. There you go. That, that's kind of important. So here, here's what we normally use. We use something called peel and stick or you know ice ice and water barrier. So this is now kind of replacing what where we used to use roofing felt. So it's called peel and stick ice and water barrier. Synthetic uh, self adhered underlayment would be the the technical term for that. Roofing components that we see on the outside, you know, uh, basically this this is a bunch of terms which get commonly confused on, on condominiums. So we see one, number two, number three, and number four. Number one would be our fascia on these roofing components. Number two would be the soffit. Um, number three is kind of our, obviously our gutter. Then number four would be our downspout. So when I think about it, I think, okay, which is it? Which which is it? Uh, soffits are horizontal section of that roof. Fascia is always vertical. So don't look at something that's horizontal and tell me that's fascia. It's not. So that's what I think about when I'm when I'm looking at a roof and and what I'm thinking about what to do. Last part of just. I got a quick question while we're on roofs. Robert with WRG, how many calls do you have to go out on where your service is needed? for emergency repair because of a faulty roof? Uh, quite frequently. Yep. Well, frequently, I think it's one of the most neglected uh, parts of, of a facility sometimes. It's just nobody wants to go up there, nobody wants to check it out, but yes, it's a, a significant portion. Um, I'll roll this over to the Falcon Group um, and ask another question. How popular have roof coatings been? We know that re-roofs are extremely expensive, but we've been applying a lot of roof coatings with a 10 year and a 20 year. Why is that such an important alternative than a complete tear off and a re-roof? Well, obviously with the, with the newer technologies and, and newer approach to this particular problem, uh, uh, the roof coatings have become a, a sort of a, a, a alternative to complete re-roofing re and replacement. And the benefits of that is obviously you don't have to remove the entire roof. You just recode the existing roof. So it saves time, saves money. Uh, 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 saves effort and uh, you don't have the roof exposed for a prolonged period of time that can cause leaks and, and things like that. So it's a more efficient, uh, easier and, and, and to a certain extent, a less expensive approach, which provides you with additional warranties for 10 or 20 years with, with these new materials. Uh, uh, obviously, with all of that, there has to be a caution, uh, selecting the right roof to be recoated. Not every roof can be recoated, no matter uh, how good the material is that we're going to put on the substrate over which we are putting this coating has to be carefully evaluated uh, uh, so we know that what we are putting is going to last. Uh, I, I want to touch base on something that was discussed here before in terms of the warranties. Uh, you know, some people think of warranties as a holy grail. Some people think of the warranties as, a, uh, you know, not worth the paper they were written on. In reality, the warranty is just a simple guarantee that the manufacturer or the contractor uh, values their own work or product. In that sense, uh, if you don't use the right substrate for recoating and the roof fails, no matter whether you have 10 or 20 year warranty, you will not get anything from that warranty because both the applicator and the manufacturer are going to tell you it's not that their product failed. It's a substrate over which the product has applied, has failed, and is excluded from the warranty. So that just goes back to it's great approach, just the roof to be recoated has to be carefully evaluated for that particular approach. Absolutely. And we see this time and time again, that the roofs are not properly taken care of. And your roof has a shelf life. 
And once it gets to a certain shelf life, it's not able to be recoded and you're not gonna have that advantage of saving time and money. It's gonna have to be a, a, a complete um, tear off and re-roof. Um, I've spoke with WRG and a, a lot of their uh, personnel, and I know that they do a lot of calls that have to, um, that are regarding roofs. So take care of your overhead occupied space, take care of your roof. Uh, you gotta take care of your complete building envelope and we're gonna get into the walls and we're gonna get into the windows and we're gonna get into the parking decks. Um, but next month we are doing a course on roof coatings. I'm going to invite everybody. If you want to learn more about roof coatings, um, we'll have that, that, that is our next class coming up, uh, in October. So, um, thank you, uh, Robert and Shinse, and then Andy back to you and let's keep a faster pace, please. I think we're a little behind the clock. Thank you. Sure. We'll, uh, keep going here. So we'll, I'm going to take a brief look at Plaza decks and parking structures. These kind of have their own specific issues. Um, Unfortunately, pretty much every plaza deck that's that's built like this will always have the same issues off the top of the bat, and it, they're going to leak down to the parking garage below. Um, we see sandset pavers in some cases. Sandset pavers have a very specific set of issues because if there's a problem, you can't figure out what the problem is until you start digging down through that sand. Um, more recently, we've started to use a pedestal type system like this. So you can see the waterproof membrane goes down and then these pedestals hold, hold the pavers off the, um, off the surface. So it's much easier to re repair and diagnose issues if there's a problem with waterproofing. We use wide joints like this. They're called movement joints. So they, they allow slabs to move independently of one another and we have to have movement of the slabs, we have to have flexibility, but we also have to waterproof that joint. And we use things like this. This would be a Migutan uh, large scale expansion or movement joint, which fills up that slot and makes it watertight, but it still allows the, the concrete slabs to move independently. So these are some of the things that you're gonna be looking at when you're looking at plaza decks and parking structures. Um, types of sealants, Nicholas Cage, my favorite actor, I like to bring him in here because he's confused. He's thinking about how many types of sealants can there possibly be? And their answer is there's uh, just a hundred different kinds. We use them on all sorts of areas on our buildings if, if we're making our building watertight like it should be. These are some of the locations where if you have an engineered specification for your painting and waterproofing job, it will call out. Um, more recently, we see paint manufacturers now starting to use this language. So th these are just some of the areas. So 90 degree angles, corners, um, anywhere we get dissimilar materials. So, so dissimilar materials would be if I have, for example, a metal window frame where that butts up to a stucco wall, that would be dissimilar materials because they're not the same material. They're going to move differently. So when they when we have a thermal expansion and contraction, they heat up, they cool down. If they don't uh, move at the exact same pace, there's going to be a crack form, and that's why we, we want to put a sealant joint between those dissimilar materials. So those are the types of things. We, that's why we use sealants in those joints. Um, here's an example of if we have a larger joint, we can use sealant backing or backer rod. You can see that at the, at the bottom of that joint. And then this is another example of, of what it looks like in the field. So we see backer rod there, the sealant will not bond to that backer rod. It's, it's a bond breaker. The sealant will bond to the, you know, the concrete substrate on either side. So that's, that's why we use backer rods. And that's, I can have a much more lengthy discussion about that, but I'm going to save it for another day. So this would be an example of putting sealants at our deck to wall intersections. So we, this is a 90 degree joint, right? We see 90, uh, we see a floor in one direction and then the wall is coming in at a completely different direction. They're 90 degrees different. And so that's one of those 90 degree intersections that we talk about the need sealants. This gentleman right here installing perimeter sealants around windows. So that's commonly a uh, part of a paint job or waterproofing job. Um, I'm not going to give you guys a break because you're all at home in your pajamas, right? So I think everybody's comfortable and we're going to keep moving. So this is what we talked about in part one. We went through, what do we see on our walls, exterior finishes, roofing, sealants, etc. Now we're going to kind of get into the meat of, of inspections and what specific details do we actually look for. So I gave you guys a hint earlier. Here are our flat roof systems. We put flat in quotation marks because if we truly have a flat roof, then we have a very large problem. A, a truly flat roof will not drain water effectively. So that will cause what's called ponding water and it's going to deteriorate our membrane. It's going to void our warranty. All sorts of terrible things happen. So these are the kind of things we think about. We think about the pitch and slope. Is the roof actually sloped to drain water? And what, what do we see up here? 
uh, when we're talking about roofs, we talk about rise over run normally. So in this section of roof here, we see three inches of rise for every 12 inches of run or vertical area. So this would be a steep slope and then a, a low slope roof would be something more along the lines of one in 10 or one in 12, something like that. But it's still, it still has some slope. So here is a quote flat roof area and this, this one actually is kind of flat. So we see an issue here. We see ineffective sloping of the roof and that's what causes ponding water. So eventually and that area is going to become very dirty. It's gonna have algae growing on it and it's going to essentially rot a hole through that membrane. Um, we do see manufacturer standard recommendations for, for ponding water. Normally, ponding water should be gone within 48 hours after a rainfall. If it's there for more than 48 hours, you may have an issue, and these are some of those things that we think about. Roof drains. Uh, if you have palm trees that are growing above your roof and you get organic materials on your roof, you, you want to be very careful about this. Basically, organic materials will clog the roof drains, and eventually the, the roof's going to fill up like a swimming pool. We do have secondary drains or, or scuppers on some roofs that are supposed to be kind of emergency drainage, but you don't want to have to depend on that um, because sometimes they're built improperly. The emergency drains are too high, and by the time that water actually reached that emergency drain, the roof would have collapsed. So we do want to inspect our primary drains, make sure they're clear of any uh, organic stuff, leaves, branches, whatever. When we're looking around our roof areas, we look for areas of field seal, failed sealants or mastics. We can kind of tell that in this case because it's cracking. Uh, like a lot of us, it cracks as it gets older. Uh, things are less than pliable, they become more brittle. So if we're looking at a flat roof membrane, when it's really old, it will start to do this. It's called alligatoring because it, it looks like an alligator skin. We, we, we look at that and that's an indication that it's aging and kind of approaching the end of its useful life. Um, they will become very brittle. Um, a very, very old mod bit roof, when you walk on it, it will actually crack underneath your feet. So those are the kind of things we think about. So we see excessive cracking. You may see granule loss. So you can kind of, if you see a, a bunch of sand piles on your roof, if you see sand piled in a corner, that's an indication that the, the granules are, are uh, letting, coming free from the roof. And then it's brittle, like we talked about. So those are the things that we can kind of judge the age of a roof membrane. So I got a question and we're talking and Scott has a question about, you know, uh, life expectancy on some of the products that we're using. When a roof is put on on a new building, let's say a condo and it's a flat roof, a brand new roof, what's the life expectancy of that? How long are you going to get out of that that roof? Yeah, let's let's hear from uh, Sanisha or one of the, uh, the project managers here about that. What's the average lifespan of a, of a newly installed roof? Well, that again, depending on the type of the roof. Uh, you have multiple systems and, and Andy brought some of them, uh, uh, you know, even on the flat roof systems, you have multiple types, uh, TPO, TPOs, uh, those thermoplastic membranes, uh, single ply roofs, then multiply roofs. And, you know, with, with all of them, they come with a different uh, uh, warranties and, and lifespans. But in reality, on a well-maintained roof, you should be expecting at least 20 to 25 years. Uh, uh, of of life, good life of the roof, uh, and the maximum, the maximum is uh, you know uh, there, there are roofs in existence that are 40 years in existence and and still performing perfectly. The the problem with uh, Florida region is the the salt uh, is the UV and obviously the hurricanes. So even in a well maintained roof after a certain time, as Andy was explaining, uh, materials become brittle, materials become uh, uh, less. Uh, elastic and as such uh, more prone to cracking or detachment, loss of adhesion. And in those cases, they will fail, not because of the roof itself, but because of the outside factors as again, as wind and, and things like that. But again, with proper maintenance, you, you can expect 20, 25 years easy of the roof. So the reason I ask that question is because there are a lot of times when people say, well, how long is this gonna last? And we have paint that has some warranties that are five years, eight years, 10 years, 15 years. Some of the sealants that we're talking about have no warranty at all. And some of them have a five, 10, 15, and even 20 year. So it all depends on the product. So the answer to my own question is nobody knows. So get in touch with uh, the Falcon Group, get in touch with DSS, 
have them help you inspect your property, get in touch with us, get in touch with um, somebody that you trust so that they can absolutely help you inspect your property because you don't know. There's been many times where I go out there and I inspect a roof with a manufacturer and they say, you don't have a lot of time left on this roof. You need to go ahead and get this roof coated and it's a $200,000 roof coating project. They say, you know what? We don't have the money this, this year. We're gonna wait till next. Well, next year was too late. And when the inspector came back out in just 12 months or 18 months, they said, you know what? This is no longer a candidate. Your $200,000 bill just went to 4 million because you got to do a complete roof off. Every year matters. Um, I, I want to ask this question to the Falcon Group and to um, DSS. How many times when somebody says, I'll wait till next year, in a year's time, in six months or 12 months, if you have delaminated stucco, if you have a small roof leak, how long, six months to a year, could be catastrophic as that problem continues to grow. Because I'm sure that you hear it, I'm sure DSS hears it, I'm sure WRG hears it. When people say I need to put this off for six to 12 months, how worse can a situation get? Well, if I may, I'll jump in on that one. So um, we hear it all the time. And a lot of the reason why we hear it is because the client is not necessarily expecting what's happening because they're unaware. And um, they try to kick the can down the road, as we say. But we always inform the client that kicking the can down the road is only gonna make things worse. These issues are exponential as, as time progresses, right? They get exponentially worse as time progresses. And the, if, if it's properly planned at that point, from that point moving forward, we also tell them you, you're never gonna pay as little as you're gonna pay now because you have to take escalation costs into consideration and you have to take the, the, um, the increase in deterioration into consideration. So uh, addressing the issue as best as possible at that point in time is definitely the way to go. If they can't address the full issue, like a full roof replacement, since we were speaking of that, and applying uh, a, a band-aid to it to buy a few years, five, 10, five years, 10 years, that could be the way to go. And then they could start planning financially speaking from that point moving forward. So that is, is better than kicking the can down the road altogether. But it, it, when it needs to be addressed, it needs to be addressed. And, and the most important part of the building, like we've already said, is the envelope, especially the roof. Yep. So Jessica and I tried to get a bank partner um, we were pressed for time because we're putting together this event and we're also doing our, our normal nine to five jobs. Um, next time we will have a bank partner on there and they can talk about emergency loans and uh, access to resources to make sure that you do go ahead and you don't put it off. Don't let money, and I know it's very important, but you know, find a way to get it done because I've seen the story time and time again where people say, I need to wait six months, I need to wait 12 months. and the problem just grew to a, a point they can't even comprehend. Um, a question on high def shingles, aside from the cost, what's the difference between a high def shingle and a basic shingle? Uh, Andy, have you done any um, research on high def shingles? So when they say high def, I, I'm assuming that they're referring to an architectural shingle, which is generally a, a higher quality than what would than a three tab shingle. And uh, that's kind of a different discussion. I don't have the slides set up here, but Normally, a high def, a high what's what in quotation marks high def shingle will be of, of a thicker material, so it will last it longer than uh, than it's you know would otherwise. Um, you know they call things fifty year shingles in Florida. That's not going to be a fifty year shingle. Um, it might be a thirty year shingle. Um, so the, that's that's usually what they mean when they say high def. They mean thicker, and they mean it's it, it has a staggered appearance as opposed to a, a three tap shingle. Hey, Rudy, before we get away from money too much, I'd like to remind everybody but that money will never be as cheap as it is, is today. It is, it is absolutely imperative how much more they can get on these low interest rates. And we are not bankers at all, but, but I just want to make sure that people understand that. So if they kick it down a year, you got the exponential growth of, of the damage that's occurring on the property. But they're also the potentially going to be paying a higher interest rate. So really now is a, is a great time. And that's not a sales pitch. It's just a fact. And Rudy, on that note, if you don't mind, I, 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 
I think we have an attorney on the call as well. Uh, and that may be a perfect opportunity uh, for the end to, to, to maybe touch on the liability that the board and the building might be having if you know, we decide, hey, we know there is a problem, but yeah, we'll do it next year. Is there a liability associated with that? Well, I apologize because the lovely Diane did sneak in here and I didn't see her. Um, yes, um, let's talk about the liability. If somebody says, you know, we don't have it, we need to wait six months, we need to wait 12 months. Um, what kind of can of worms are they opening? And you're on mute, so you gotta come off mute. Thank you, thank you very much. First of all, I just wanna let you know that I apologize that Paul is not on today. So uh, he would be a better person to answer it, but I do know that there is a fiduciary responsibility. And once they're on notice, they must handle that right away. So that's the big liability that they have, is that once there is a leak, there is they identify any kind of an issue, the board is now on notice and they have a fiduciary responsibility. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Andy, let's pick up the pace. You're doing great, by the way, bud. Keep it up. Aw, thanks, Rudy. I bet you say well, that to all the presenters. I only have one and it's you. <laughs> what, we're, we're still on the subject of roof inspections. What do we look at? AC racks are a big deal. Um, as the building codes change, change we have to uh, modify our AC racks and if we replace our roofs, we normally have to replace our AC racks as well. So these are the kind of things we want to look at. Is there an AC rack or are condensing units sitting directly on top of the roof membrane? If so, that's a problem. So these are some of the things we think about. Um, on the older buildings, you know, 60s, 1970s condos, you will see condensing units sitting directly on the roof membrane with no attachment at all. So that's, that's what I look at when I'm thinking about AC racks flat roof considerations. Um, Sanisha hinted at this when he was talking about, okay, do we want to recoat or re-roof? What makes more sense? Um, we have different materials that we can use and the, the material that we use kind of depends on the performance expectations. An acrylic coating is kind of a, uh, a, a inexpensive band-aid that we can use, but it doesn't last as long. A silicone coating is an awesome product, um, but it's also the most expensive product. So it depends on what we want to pay and what our performance expectations are depending on the liquid uh, coating used to coat a flat roof area, we, we may be able to get a 10 year or a 20 year leak proof warranty. So it depends on the manufacturer and what type of system is used. But those are the kind of things we think about. And as Rudy said, we have a the entire roof coatings presentation that we can get more into. Metal roof systems, normally there's not a lot to inspect um, because there's not a lot that goes wrong. These roofs are generally speaking a, a higher quality than, than other types of systems. Um, what we do see is rusting fasteners a lot. So uh, anybody that has a boat knows that there's stainless steel and then, you know, stainless steel. Not all stainless steel is the same grade. So when we do see metal roof systems, it's not the, the panels themselves are fine, but we will see rusting fasteners in a lot of areas. So like we said, they, they last forever. Um, we can check our sealants like we talked about previously. And that's what we think about. Sloped roof system. So this would be a steep slope group system. Normally, there's not a lot to, you know, inspect as a, an association manager. We're not really going to want you up on the, that roof anyway. So we can check for granular loss. So kind of just like with the flat roof area where we talked about granules or the sand um, uh, coming off of the, of the membrane, the same thing happens on a shingle roof. So when you see shingles that are very old, inst instead of seeing those granules like you do there, it, it becomes a very flat surface. It becomes much more uh, slippery to walk on and, and easier to fall off of. So those are system uh, indications that the shingle roof is reaching the end of its useful life. And normally when you see an issue, a shingle roof will fail not at the, not in the field itself, but it's gonna fail where that roof meets a wall. So in this case, this would be a roof to wall intersection that has to be waterproofed effectively, and many times it's not. So in this photo, we can see where water has gotten in where that roof meets the wall. And then there's uh, the OSB sheathing below that. So basically, it's kind of like plywood, it's not plywood. But we, you can see on the right side of that wall above the window where that has rotted the, the wood sheathing. And that's the consequence of a leak at a roof to wall intersection. So that's, that's the types of things that we usually see. We get a lot of questions about algae staining and it's, it's a very common everywhere. Um, we can have shingles now that when they are installed, the shingles are impregnated with a, a chemical that 
uh, resists the growth of algae. Um, but if we have roofs that are already algae stained, we, we want to be very careful. We, we don't want someone up there with a pressure washer because that could damage the roof. Um, normally we use a, a peroxide type system, uh, something that you can just, you spray it on, you let it foam up, and then you low pressure rinse that off of the, the roofs. So that's, that's what we want to think about if we're looking at algae staining. Getting into exterior wall inspections. Uh, these are the kind of things we think about. What kind of wall is it? Is it a concrete block system is, or is it a frame system? Because these things have different red flags that we want to look for and they have different um, good things and bad things that we want to think about. Um, okay, so it's time for you guys to chime in, make a quick comment. How can we tell which one is a block wall and which one's a frame wall? So if you want to comment real quick, you can tell me which one just by inspection, hopefully you can tell me which one is a concrete block or reinforced concrete wall and which one is a frame wall. Which one of these buildings has wood frame inside of it? Is there a good way that we can tell this just by from the outside with, without using our x-ray vision to look inside the walls? Um, let's see. What do you think, Rudy? We got any comments from the fans? And you're muted, Rudy. Yep. Um, left is block. Block is on the left. Good. Linda, did she win anything? She wins my gratitude. Linda's doing great. Great job. She's, Linda. she's hot stuff this morning. She's just on fire. Um, that's that's right. So on the left would, would be concrete block. And that, that might be reinforced concrete. So forgive me if it's not actually block. But the point is a reinforced concrete or, or uh, block area is going to have, the, the windows are going to be recessed. So you can see in that photo on the left, how those windows are recessed a good six to eight inches. And on the right, this would be an example of our incredibly terrible construction practices in Florida where we have flush mounted windows. Normally, when we see the windows like that, it's going to be frame. So it's going to be either wood or metal frame on the inside. And we see these flush mount windows that are very difficult to waterproof effectively and are probably going to be leaking. And if it's that, if you see those windows on the outside, you can guarantee the uh, developer put in the absolute cheapest windows he or she could find and probably this wall is going to be leaking. So that's that's what we think about with block versus frame and what we look at. Um, we're in Florida. We know water is going to get in places that we don't want it to get into. So the assumption has to be water is going to get in. How will it get out of the wall? Um, very briefly, I'm going to talk about a drainage plane system because this is the way that water is supposed to travel down behind a stucco over wood frame structure. I have another class just on this, but the red path in this area would be water traveling down. And then when water goes to the bottom, we see a head flashing and water in theory can get out of the building. So that, that would be one example. And this is another example at the base of the building. Um, we have what's called a weep screed. So moisture can weep out of the walls at the base of that wall. That's how a frame building deals with moisture intrusion in theory. Um, a lot of times we can't tell if it's draining effectively because we're not going to see much. It's easier to tell if it is not draining effectively. So with stucco, it's going to lead to cracks and paint bubbles in the stucco. Siding, it might rot out. We might see chunks missing from the siding. So with these frame structures, we a lot of times we see what's called stealth leaks because we can't see them until there's a, a big problem. Um, Looking at concrete block from the exterior, this is what we see a lot of. We see stair step cracking. Um, we see st some stuff that might be settlement cracking. So we, we want to kind of take an evaluation of that. Normally, normally, stair step cracking like this is not really a structural issue. It's, um, it's caused by thermal expansion and contraction uh, of that concrete block wall. It, it heats up, it cools down in, in the sun, and we're, we're going to see a little bit of that cracking. So normally, when we see something like this, it's, it's not a structural issue. Hey Andy, let's talk about cracks real quick. So Jared had a question earlier and I have another, another panelist. Um, one of my panelists has an HOA, five units. They have stucco walls. They've heard the pros and cons regarding acrylic uh, and elastomeric paint. Um, the building's 23 years old and it was painted eight years ago. It's showing significant signs of step cracking. So do they go with an acrylic? Do they go with an elastomeric? Um, Jessica, you might be able to um, help answer this question. If somebody has something that's ex significant as the picture that Andy's showing, um, is this something that can be solved with an acrylic or elastomeric paint? Or, you know, do they need to get the Falcon Group out there to do an assessment on, on the concrete? Yeah, we always um, suggest to call the engineers so they, they can 
um, add that to the spec and you know go and walk the property and see what damage the concrete has and the property has and then after that we can suggest some products maybe we can use a, a um, complex that's one of the products that we can use and if they want to go to the acrylic we um, recommend duration or super paint so before we get there and i know that that's a great answer and that's exactly what i was looking for um, so do ever whoever asked that question um, what are some of the other type of products that you guys have you know, a lot of time these cracks are going to be so big and I know that we do a lot of routing and sealing and we do, you know, stucco delamination and that's things that we do. Um, but I'll ask the Falcon Group, um, based on this picture right here, and I know you can't, you know, you don't have the full scope of work, you know, is this something that can be taken care of with, you know, just an exterior type of application or do we got to get out the heavy tools and, you know, do a little bit more work? Um, it depends. So, um, we have to go and take pictures and go with the engineer. We, so we, we recommend to, to just to, to try to repair that before we start coding. Because after we start coding and um, apply a super paint, a duration, and a critic paint, it can start coming again, maybe in a, in a year or so. You can go in different routes. You can go, you have to see how is your budget before you start getting some decisions. Sinashe, what do you think? Can you tell well, by the picture? Well, uh, uh, again, by, by picture alone, it's very difficult because uh, uh, the question is how old are these cracks and have they already allowed water behind the stucco that could potentially delaminate the stucco beyond what is shown as a crack. So in reality, if this crack does not have a structural uh, uh, cause behind it, such as some kind of a uh, 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 you know wall problem or, a, 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 or, uh, or something like that as a settlement issue, which Again, may not very well be, but if we are talking strictly as a stucco problem, this can de definitely be uh, patched. Uh, if would, I don't recommend uh, this being done purely with a paint. This would first have to be routed and sealed in some manner using mm -hmm. some sealant to create a proper substrate for your paint uh, uh, application. However, if the water has go gone behind the stucco and started delimiting the stucco uh, beyond what the crack shows, you would probably have to go and, and chip the stucco uh, of the building, you know, prep the surface properly, and then, and then you know, reapply stucco, uh, 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 potentially solve any, any, you know, issues with the substrate, put the stucco back and then paint using appropriate paint. And as Andy said, uh, I'm 100% I'm in agreement with high build paints, especially in the regions where you're close to water, close to uh, 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 salt and things like that. Uh, those paints uh, are, are proving to be excellent uh, solution and, uh, and protection for, for your building. I know that we have WRG on, on this and some of the stucco problems and a lot of building departments are looking for this and maybe they can give us a little bit of that is that stucco removal sometimes, and I know City of Coral Gables is particular about this, yields asbestos uh, 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 testing of the stucco to ensure that, you know, we are not uh, having those problems as well. So that, that's something that you have to be careful about when we talk about stucco problems. Yeah, Robert, and before we got to stucco, when we we're on roofs, I wanted to bring up asbestos and roofs. How many times are we, we don't know, and we begin a roof tear off or even a roof coating, and we find this in the roofs more uh, times than one would think. That, that's actually a very, very good point. Uh, you know, asbestos seems to be one of those things that uh, people think has disappeared and it's no longer around. Um, that's actually a big misconception. Asbestos is uh, found in, in, a, in a slew of uh, building products, uh, especially involving the building envelope. Um, starting from the roof, you've got your roof felts, you've got your roofing mastics, uh, your pitch pans. Um, on your exterior, you could have your stucco, your window caulking. Um, some facilities have a transite cement panels that are located on the outside. Um, most buildings uh, constructed before 1985 uh, contain asbestos in one way, shape, or form. And uh, Coral Gables, but almost all counties, uh, prior to uh, issuing a permit, will be requesting an asbestos survey. So that is uh, definitely an important aspect and something that should be uh, factored and taken into consideration um, before any uh, uh, renovation or, 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 or repairing uh, commences. So yeah, Rudy, very, very good point. It is, it is still out there and it is relevant and hence that's why we're here. That's why you, if, if you're getting into a project and you feel that it's small, you feel that it's mid-sized, you feel that it's large, 
get an engineer involved, call WRG, call DSS, or somebody like their, them, and make sure that you have proper representation. And in speaking about representation, make sure that you have a lawyer, make sure that you're represented. And you know, you can't just, and, and, and I'm a contractor, and there's a lot of times when I go out on a job and I say, time out, we don't really wanna even have a further discussion until you get an engineer involved and until you get a lawyer involved so that everyone is protected. You know, um, there are good contractors out there that are gonna do the right thing and we're gonna point you in the right direction to make sure that you have the proper representation. Um, you know, Rudy, let me add one more thing into that. Uh, and that's very a good point because whereas uh, removing asbestos is absolutely a uh, requirement, if it's not handled properly, the fines are quite extensive. And it's really an issue that's best be avoided because if you think your budget is being blown because of doing renovation, add an asbestos fine into the mix. Best to be avoided. Yes, I agree. Andy, continue. And we're back. <laughs> we were talking about walls and what we look at on walls. Stair step cracking like we're talking about is normally not, not a structural issue. Uh, it changes when you get into something like this, which is more indicative of, of settlement cracking. We can see these, these cracks are much larger. And when uh, oftentimes with settlement cracking, we'll actually see the crack going not along the joint, of the block, but actually through the face of the block. And this is actually a, a area that I was looking at last week. So we can see at the top of that photo that is following the joint lines of the concrete block. And at the bottom right where my tape measure is, you can see that, okay, now the crack's going through the face of the block. This is a little bit more significant. So here is a, a close up of that. You can see the, how the, the line of the crack changes because something bigger is happening. And in this case, they actually had a, a sinkhole underneath their house. and. Um, this is their garage floor. You can see where it's all, it's about two inches of, of differential, of height differential between the areas. So this was actually a, a settlement issue. And we can see that the cracking through the face of the block that kind of suggested that that was happening. With our exterior walls, we see corrosion spalling. So like we talked about, steel rust, steel expands, concrete can't expand, so it cracks and spalls. Um, paints and coating failures, just real quick, um, bagging and blistering. So we talked about those, those water balloons on the sides of elastomeric buildings that we see a lot. Um, if it is the first repaint for an association, normally they should plan on waterproofing because most likely the developer did not waterproof those walls. Uh, typical lifespan for coatings is, is seven years. Um, in Florida, we, we sometimes say, okay, you, this is a 10-year coating and it, may, it might make it 10 years, but realistically it's between seven to 10 years and 10 years is really stretching it. Okay, so the, you know, some paint manufacturers have come out with these, these warranties that are just <laughs> 10 plus years, and I, I kind of shake my head because that's, that's a lot to ask for a coating in, in Florida, but we'll see. That's just my opinion. Uh, again, no breaks, sorry. Um, go do whatever you want, but smoke a cigarette. Um, anticipating the problem is what have we talked about? Roof inspections, exterior wall inspections, windows, and storm shutters. So windows have these amazing things called weeps on them and weeps allow water to to get out so we say windows need weeps like a fat kid needs cake my absolute favorite slide in, in my whole presentation is this guy here eating the cake and um you know windows need weeps so if we have windows and and we have little holes underneath the windows that are intended for water to drain out we want to make sure that our painters don't get over eager and caulking and sealing everything don't seal up those holes, they're there for a reason. They're called weeps and they allow your window to drain. So keep that in mind. Um, window tips, we, we have two different types of sealants, primary sealants around windows. We see perimeter sealants, we see wet glazing sealants. This gentleman here is applying perimeter sealants around uh, what looks like a door frame. And then this guy here is putting on wet glazing. So normally as part of a painting waterproofing project, we, we don't use wet glazing. This is very nasty, very expensive stuff. You're not gonna redo those sealants unless there's a pretty big existing problem. But perimeter sealants are normally done as part of that work. Um, Rudy, can you still hear me okay? I'm, I'm backing up this mic a little bit from my mouth. Is it, am I still coming through clear? Yeah, you look very comfortable too. Do I look good? You want to sit up? I'm sorry. You kind I of got a Detroit lean going on. I, I actually was really comfortable, but you know, whatever. Sit up. So a couple questions, real quick. Can you use a high build acrylic coating to prevent water intrusion caused by a large map cracking on an area on exterior shear wall? I would not recommend that. I'm going to answer this as a contractor, but I'm going to 
uh, Shinche or, or Andy, please uh, come in. Let's get out there and inspect that and let's see how big that crack is. Um, let's see what's behind that crack. Um, I mean, what, what do you guys think about using just a high build acrylic to prevent water intrusion? Well, again, depending on, on the systems, I, I personally uh, uh, don't like just uh, 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 applying paint over any cracking without understanding better what that cracking is and how extensive it is. And, uh, 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 you know, some, some paints have that uh, elastic properties to them that can bridge the cracks and protect it properly. But uh, if possible, I would rather avoid that. Okay, thanks. The difference between a high def shingle and a basic shingle, um, I actually put the phone on mute and we, we are a, a state certified uh, roofing contractor and I called my roofing lead. The, the high dimensional shingle has highs and lows. It's a little bit thicker. It's a little bit more stable. It's gonna last a little bit longer compared to a basic shingle, which is just a three tab shingle. So there's obviously a cost difference and it's just like everything else, it's based on the material. So you're gonna get a longer lifespan out of a high a dimensional shingle than a basic shingle. All right, Andy, let's go. All right. Well, I'm sitting up. I'm less comfortable now, but sure, I'll keep going. Yep, good. Win uh, window inspections. So a lot of times we get called out to look at leaks. And what we want to do is we want to look inside the tops of that window and, and feel below the window. And we want to keep in mind that just because we see a leak in one area, it's not necessarily that the window is leaking. It could very well be that water's coming in above and we, we just see that leak making itself known at that window because that's where water can come inside for the first time. So just because it's, it's uh, leaking at a, just because we see a leak at a window, it doesn't necessarily mean that the window is leaking. So keep that in mind. Um, sliding glass doors, what do we think of? We first want to see a step down. So here's an example of a, of a sliding glass door on a balcony and we can see the threshold. If the outside deck is the same level at, as the inside of the unit, it's going to be very tough to waterproof. And we see that most often with the older buildings built in the 70s and 80s, that they're at the same level, very difficult to waterproof. What's much easier to waterproof is if there is actually a step down. So this would be a cutaway or a cut through section of a sliding glass door. So the interior of the unit would be on the left and the outside deck would be on the right. So this is what's called a step down. and um, we want to make sure that water is draining away from the sliding glass door. Water should be pitching out and away. So we want to check for sloping or pitch. If it is not pitched properly, if it's not sloped properly, a lot of times it's very dirty in front of that sliding glass door because it traps water and it holds water there all the time. So that's one way to check it. We can also use our little golf ball check up, put a golf ball out in front of the sliding glass door. If it doesn't move, give it just a little tap to give it some encouragement. And a lot of times you can, you can see exactly which way it's sloped kind of very quickly and easily. Hey Ben, how many windows have you come across, sliding glass doors or windows, on new construction that has been just totally builder grade, bottom of the barrel, just totally done and complete? On a scale on, from 0% to 100%, the, the installs that you do where you're tearing out a, an old system, the new system, or the old system, how many of the old systems are just 100% totally incorrect? Yeah, um, it happens all too often, Rudy, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, I, I, I just want to go back to a good point that Andy made, you know, with, with, with uh, regard to sliding glass doors and then sitting above, to some extent, the uh, uh, exterior decking. Um, we go back to the weep holes as well. If, if you have a sliding glass door that's sitting level with the exterior um, floor covering or the same level as the deck, the weep holes are sitting on the face of that sliding glass door track. So the sliding glass door won't be able to weep the water out quick enough. It'll build up, it'll come inside the unit and or it'll go into the concrete and then you'll start seeing leaks inside the units and or the units below. Yep, thank you. Hey Rudy. Yes. For a $25 gift card, first person that's a property manager or a board member that answers this question on the chat. How many dimples are average on a golf ball? Ooh, how, how many, many dimples, dimples are on a golf ball on average? You want me to start calling them out? No, we can just move on after that. I will look on the list and I'll make sure this gift card gets that person. I just want to have a little bit of fun. Get your Great guess. In. How many dimples are on a golf ball? Right. Having fun. Who, who said you could My have daughter fun? has two dimples. But I, a golf like ball has more. I don't like fun. I'm moving on. 
Sorry. Walkways and balconies, what do we want to look at? Uh, so walkways are basically just giant balconies. It has a lot of the same issues. We want to check for slope. We want to check to make sure that it's waterproofed. Um, trick, it's a trick question because it's in Florida and, and usually they never waterproof walkways the first time around. Um, unless that specific uh, developer has been sued for that before. It's difficult to tell unless it's bare concrete. Um, let's see here. I, I'm going to show you some pictures of that going forward. Um, guardrail areas, we, we, we can do some really good basic checks. We can do the, the shake test of a guardrail where you basically just shake it as hard as you can and see what happens. Uh, hopefully you're, you're standing a little bit ways back from the edge when you do that. Guardrails have to meet a certain load requirement per the Florida Building Code, and that's a 50 pound per linear foot distributed load. So basically, like imagine someone leaning on the guardrails or, or uh, uh, basically laying on top of a guardrail. It also has to resist a 200 pound point load. So basically, so imagine someone running into it with a force of 200 pounds. So if I come up to a guardrail and I, I start to shake it as hard as I can and it deflects significantly, that suggests to me that the guardrails are not code compliant in terms of what, what load they can resist. It also has to resist dimensional requirements, which we'll look at in just a second. So here's, here's me conducting my shake test. That's an actual photo of one of my inspections. Here's the guardrail dimensional requirements. So our guardrails must resist a four inch sphere. So if you got a little four inch sphere, you should be able to place it anywhere on that guardrail system and you can't stick it through. So the, the old limit was six inches wide. Now the, the applicable limit is four inches wide. Guardrails also have to be a minimum of 42 inches high off of your deck. So if we have a balcony deck or we have a walkway, it, it has to be a minimum of 42 inches high. Now, keep in mind, if your developer gave you a condo with rails that were exactly 42 inches high, what happens if your one of your owners puts down a tile system on their deck that's one inches thick? What once was 42 inches high guardrails, now they're 41 inches high, no longer code compliant. So it's important to check the, the height of those guardrails because if, God forbid, if somebody falls over and the lawyers find out that the uh, guardrails weren't high enough and you as the association allowed that to happen, that could be a problem. So keep in mind and, and don't and look carefully before you allow your homeowners to install uh, um, thick tile systems on their balconies. So guardrail dimensional requirements, four inch sphere, 42 inches high. Are guardrails waterproofed? Um, we, the, there's some very simple things we can look at. This is a pretty clear example that these rails are not waterproofed because we can see a big divot in what's called the post pocket. So at the base of that guardrail post, that's the post pocket, that's where the, the post meets the slab, and we can see that this would obviously collect water, right? We can also see that it's bare concrete, so it's never been waterproofed. Here's another great example. This is on the exterior, so here's our, our guardrail post pocket, which has never been filled, it will trap water. Now, why do we care about a guardrail trapping water? We care because when water gets into the, into the guardrail system, it makes its way into the reinforced concrete slab and it eventually causes things to spall. So if you look at this photo, if you look below where these railing posts meet, you can see concrete spalls all over this building and they're almost all occurring directly below a guardrail post because it was never properly waterproofed. So that's something we want to think about and we can, it's very easy for us to visually check. Guardrail paint coatings, um, just real quick talk about uh, what happens and, and what we what we can expect. Um, normally these these guardrails have a, a powder coat system come from the factory. So if you just try to go back with brushing and rolling the guardrails, it will not look as good. Um, a couple other options are HVLP. HVLP stands for high velocity, low pressure. And then you can look at uh, using an electrostatic system to repaint the guardrails. So that's uh, guardrail paint coating systems are very specific to that one thing. We use things there that we don't really use anywhere else on the building, but that's that's the type of things we can think about. Um, expansion joints on plaza decks. We we talked about this. What can we look at? Y usually, we're going to see it inside the 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 parking garage below our expansion joint. So here's an example of what we'll see. You can see where this expansion joint was leaking for le years through the ceiling and it started to make these spalls on the ceiling. Um, here's a close up of that. We can also see that there is not enough of a joint between these two concrete slabs and you can see where that ceiling looks all dirty and nasty and it's, it's where water is coming through long term. So we can use expansion joints to do that. We talked about that. 
here's what an ex expansion joint looks like when it's properly installed. And so here's this joint and we see sand set pavers around that expansion joint. No breaks. Real world example. Quick question, quick question. Yep. There are paint systems that last seven to 10 years. This is probably a quite better question for Jessica. Um, she's just smarter and way better looking than you. So I'm gonna go to Jessica <laughs> on this one. Um, seven to 10 years on a paint system, does Sherman Williams offer a 12 or a 15 year warranty on exterior paint systems? Um, yes, but we don't recommend it in this um, state. In Florida is like um, after seven years, we have to go and um, re-inspect that building because the weather and we, this is our recommendation that we, you can have a 10 years warranty paint, but at seven years, you have to have that budget thinking that you have to repaint that building before you have start getting problem with the stucco and restoration and all this stuff. Yeah, I mean, paints perform differently all over the, the country. Um, mm -hmm. And Florida, Texas, Arizona, Southern California, uh, they're just different animals with the UV rays, with the heat, with the salt. So mm -hmm. seven to 10 years is a sweet spot. Um, yep. And like, you know, the Falcon Group said, the warranties are kind of just as good as kind of who puts them on and don't use the warranty as kind of your hard start and your hard stop. Um, exactly. Seven to 10 years is the sweet spot. Thank you, Andy. Yep. Continue. I'm going to move quickly through these because I want to get to my little quiz area. Um, he, this is just an example of what a stucco over wood frame, what happens to a stucco over wood frame building when water gets in long term. And really good example here, we talk about OSB or oriented strand board sheathing. So OSB is in the top part of this wall and then actual plywood is in the bottom part of this wall. So you can see OSB just has a terrible response. When it gets wet, it, it turns into mulch. And so if I have a choice when I'm you know, performing repairs or, or going in with a new system, I will always want to use exterior grade plywood, actual plywood versus OSB um, or, or similar sheathing. So that's one thing to think about and, and just ask your contractor what they're using or what they plan to use. Make sure it's real plywood, like what we see on the bottom, not, not OSB like up top. Um, we, we talked about a lot of these things and that's, this is what is required to effectively weatherproof a stucco over wood frame building. So here's another good example of concrete building on the beach, uh, a typical beachside condominium reinforced concrete. So we can see spalling there. And here's underneath a guardrail area. So we see, this is a, a vertical shot looking down. We can see our guardrail post and we can see a spall forming directly underneath that railing post bucket. Reinforcing steel rust, reinforcing steel expands, and that's why we see spalls and why we need uh, concrete repair to, to occur after that. So with that being said, we have now reached the section where we get to our pop quiz. So this is where I'd like everybody to chime in and, and uh, give me your answers and we can keep moving forward. Um, which is a common system, roofing system commonly used in Florida? So I got, I got three options for you here bitumen modified asphalt or mod bit, reinforced concrete block, masonry, or asphalt shingles. What are you guys thinking? Let me know. Jared says A and C. J Jared, I mean, I thought the other person that answered was on fire. Jared is on fire. Jared's Lopez really the all-star. Helena's got D. Jasmine has D. I don't I don't, know I don't, I don't, I don't care about any of those people. Cool. Okay, Jared's the real MVP today. I mean, he's been all over the board. <laughs> Okay, second question. Name two locations where sealants or caulking is required. Can somebody give me just a couple of locations? We, we looked at those areas. There was a long list of where we need sealant applied on buildings. Um, engineers, architects, you know, used to, uh, used to list the areas. Now sealant manufacturers are also saying, I'm sorry, paint manufacturers are also saying where we need it. So what are just a couple spots where we think we need sealants? What do you say, Rudy? Window frames, at openings, 90 degree angles, windows, windows, doors, roof joints, windows, windows and joints. Yeah. You know, Scott, Scott brought up a really good, Scott's one of our, our um, participants. He brought up a really good point that a lot of times when you're protecting the build, building envelope, they're not protecting the removal and the replacement of the sealants around the windows. Ben, you install windows for a living and you will put a sealant on there. The question I have for you is, do you have a conversation with the customer on what type of sealant? 
because from my understanding, there are five year, 10 year, 15 year um, sealants. Do you have a conversation on, on what type of sealants you use or is there just a common sealant that's your go-to? Yeah, we typically get the specification from the engineer. Um, so, you know, I'll always throw it back to the engineer, but um, there are commonly used sealants in the window and door industry. Uh, many of them are either a polyurethane based or um, some sort of silicone based. Um, but, you know, we, we, we express all of those um, ideas to the end user. We let them know that there are different textures to them, but at the end of the day, we follow the engineer spec. So someone just commented, it should match up with the life of your paint. Usually, from my experience, we'll have a paint project and for every other paint project, that's when the window sealants are, usually every 10 to 15 years. And usually the paint is, paint cycles every seven years. Um, Sinshay, do you find that true? Does, when you're engineering and when you're looking at these buildings and you're looking at kind of the window sealants, do you find that the life expectancy of the window sealants is usually a little bit longer than the paint cycle? Yeah, uh, as a matter of fact, depending again on the type of a sealant you're using, silicon sealant can last uh, uh, even 20 years. Again, if you do, uh, uh, if they're properly applied and, and you know, good brand, uh, uh, good quality, they, they can last far longer than, than the usual paint cycle. And in paint cycle in Florida uh, was seven years. It seems like in, in, in recent years, it became 10 years, specifically because of the warranties that have been applied to this high build acrylic paint, uh, which again, it's very important for, to mention that uh, between those two, uh, uh, the, the, it's not about just the paint, a uh, big part of any life of the condo is also the aesthetics. So just the, because the paint may you know, last 10 years, let's say, uh, functioning properly, the dirt accumulation on the paint is going to make your building. You want to paint it not because of paint itself, but because you want the building to look nice. Uh, uh, and then going back to sealants, it is very important to pick your sealants right. And more importantly, when it comes to sealants, there is a thing called reseal. Let's apply sealant over sealant, even if we do re uh, you know, paint jobs. It's, sometimes that's not even possible. I, I, I stay away from it as much as possible. Uh, as a matter of fact, either don't do sealants or replace them all, but don't try to attempt sealant over sealant, especially if you don't know what's applied before, because nothing can stick for without extensive work over the silicone sealants, and you're just going to invite failure on your building down the road, and then you're going to go through a lengthy warranty process, fights legal, and so on and so forth. So it looks like someone did a 10-year paint system with a 10-year sealant. Um, that still needs to be inspected after uh, seven years. Um, I think that's a good rule of thumb. I think that was a smart move. Uh, if you have everything up there, if you have your, um, you have your drops and you have your scaffolding and you do a 10 year system and then the 10 year sealant. And I agree, we see a lot of times that people put what we call a beauty bead where the sealant is already in the window and they just put a bead over that and they kind of cover that up. Uh, well, you're not gonna guarantee proper adhesion. So remo complete removal and replacement uh, is, is the way to go if you're, if you're flirting with that. So, um, Andy, I'm sorry to ruin your quiz. I know you get really excited about your quizzes. So. You literally ruined the entire thing now, Rudy. I don't even know where I was. Uh, yeah. Let's keep going. <clears throat> we talked about veneer systems. We talk about mass storage systems. Uh, so basically, different types of things we see. Which of these following would be a veneer system? So we got stuck over metal frame. Ooh, melt-a-wall assemblies. That's probably a good choice. Um, siding. What do you guys think? Um, which Stuff is a veneer system? Ryan, siding says Kelly. Yeah, where's where's uh where's my boy Jared at? He says Nothing. he doesn't know. LOL. Oh god. <laughs> so in this case, stucco over metal frame and siding. Those are both going to be veneer systems. Reinforced concrete would would be a, a, a concrete block would be like a mass storage system. Hollow melt wall assemblies. That's not even an option. So you know, just forget you even saw that. Um, correct dimensional requirements for guardrails. Let's see, we got a kid's head size, diameter of a small cheeseburger, 99th percentile child. Uh, which one's the right answer? How high should these rails be? Let's see. B, B, B. Okay, good. 42 inches high, it's your magic number. And remember, be very Ryan, careful. Hey, Ryan, you weren't paying attention. Uh, Ryan, get out of here, just leave. Um, well, 
they put a six inch tile system on the patio and it raises it six inches, then it will be at 42, so that will work. Yeah, Ryan, gosh. All right, the answer is 42 inches high, four inch sphere, okay? That's, that's what we look at. Um, oh my God, last question, windows need weeps. What do we, what do we think here? Joni loves Chachi. That's, a, that's actually a, a dodgeball movie reference. <laughs> um, D, if you D. get this right, you, you, loves you win everything. Everybody loves D. Okay. A fat kid needs cake. Windows need weeps. So don't call the, the window weeps. Remember that they're there for a reason. Um, that time's up. Look like a young Andy. That kid eating the cake. I get that a lot. I mean, I'm, what can I say? I'm handsome and smart. I'm kind of a, a true triple threat, to be honest. Uh, you guys did awesome. Everybody passed except for Ryan. Um, question and answer session. I'll give it back to the panel. Great. Great job. Yeah, thanks, Andy. It was great. Um, so a few questions on weep holes. I've seen a lot of I've seen a lot of frames and Ben, you can that where the frame sitting here and this is the outside and literally the, the bottom track is like this. The weep holes are over here. So it's supposed to weep out here, but the track is literally going towards the unit. How many times do you see something like that, Ben? Yeah, actually, I, I see it quite often, but um, it, it's actually pretty interesting. What we do with the sliding glass door tracks, um, again, per engineer spec, is a lot of the time we'll put a high-strength leveling grout, non-shrink, underneath the sliding glass door track so that the sliding glass door track, when it's put in place and it's leveled and true and plumb properly, um, it has an inherent pitch in it that will allow the water will to drain out properly. So a lot of the time we're using a non-shrink, non-shrink, high strength leveling grout underneath the tracks to ensure that the deck beneath it is um, going to allow for a level true and plumb door to be installed. I, number one, I want to open it up to everyone that's um, participating. Please, if you have any questions, let us know. I also want to give Diana a chance to formally introduce herself and her company. Um, my screen's only so big and she snuck in and I didn't see her. So if she would uh, introduce herself, we would, uh, we would appreciate it. Oh, you're on mute. You're on mute, Diane. Diana, you're on mute. That dang mute button. It's my bad. I didn't read my instructions today. So I take full responsibility for that. So I was supposed to get on 15 minutes early and let you know I was on, but I didn't let you know. So Angus and Terry is a law firm that construction that specializes in construction defects. So if you have any uh, questions or or any um, I, thoughts that you might have a defect, especially for properties that are under 10 years, uh, that's really where our specialty is: is new development, developer transition. That time, you let us know, and our law firm will go in. We'll check out. Your, you know, your, your uh, community. And if it is a construction defect issue, we'll let you know. If it is not a construction defect issue, we let you know that as well. And we operate under contingency. So most of the associations that retain our firm like the fact that we will advance all the costs. We bring in the experts such as uh, Sinisi and, and our contractors um, to inspect and do whatever the process is that needs to be done. And then we also, uh, until we recover, um, there's no cost to the association. So they continue with their operations of their daily, you know, issues that they might need to take care of while we handle that construction defect for them and pay our experts for them. And once we recover, which is usually, you know, a very quick timeline because our firm is very, uh, aggressive on the deadlines and, and meeting those requirements right away for the 558 claims. And once we recover, and then we at that point uh, go through where we, we um, get paid and pay you. So if you have any questions or any, you know, with construction defects, if your community is going to transition over, contact me and we'll be more than happy to answer any questions you want or guide you through the process. Do you work in conjunction with public adjusters? Somebody asked. Yes, we do. We work with a lot of different, um, you know, our contractor that's on, um, 
we work with a lot of the uh, professionals, so we do. Awesome. I wrote down some questions that I promised that we would get to later. Post tension cables. Somebody had a question about post tension cables. James, what do we need to know about post tension cables? Sorry about that. I was muted. Um, well, it's it's a form of reinforcement in concrete versus conventional steel. Post tension cables take the place of conventional reinforcement. Um, this is obviously more of a question for the structural engineer, Sinesia from Falcon. Um, but since you ask, I'll, I'll dive into it a little bit. Uh, a, a lot of the buildings that that um, these condo, a lot of these condominium buildings have been constructed with post tension cable systems. And from what I understand, the systems were developed, uh, you know, let's say back in the 50s. The technology back then is not what it is today. So a lot of these systems have, have failed over time in some capacity, whether it's the post tension cable and the cable itself um, and so on. So they could, it, the failure of these systems could be quite problematic, uh, a little bit more problematic than your typical conventional steel deterioration. Um, something that definitely needs to be inspected and addressed. And when speaking about building envelopes, there's a great way to detect the, the, the beginning of the failure of these systems because the, the end anchors, right, whether they're live ends or dead ends, the beginning or end of a cable, um, they show signs of failure right through the stucco, right? You'll see those areas on the stucco where the post pocket um, is, is showing signs of movement or the tail is corroded to the point where you'll see those rust spots. These are good indications of, of, of the fact that something needs to be addressed and it's a prime opportunity to call in the Falcon Group, come in, they take a look, they're gonna tell you exactly what you're up against, they'll open up the little areas around the, the end of the cable um, and, and that starts the inspection process and help you it helps the, the community understand what they're up against when it comes to the repair. Awesome. Great, great, uh, great explanation. Diana, somebody posted a question about hurricane damage. How far do you go back? I think uh, the question is, if they have, if they've had a hurricane, how far can they kind of claw back to kind of put a claim in? I wish that Paul was here to answer all these for you. But as far as a hurricane, I would definitely, if you believe that if it's, uh, it has to be under 10 years. If it's an older property and you want us to come out, we will, and then we'll get you the information that you need because it might be an insurance claim. But anything that's a brand new property under 10 years old, if you even have an idea, let us know because a lot of times they are a construction defect claim and not a hurricane, like a wind damage, wind mitigation claim. Or a hur so, hurricane's gonna be a three year. Hurricane related, I'm sorry. Can't hear you. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, Falcon Group, Sinjaya, I have a question about concrete ceilings and tension cables. How far can you drill into a concrete ceiling when it has a tension cable? I guess it really depends on how wide the concrete is, where the tension cable is, but I don't know. I'm not an engineer, so I'll let you answer. Uh, very simple. Do not drill. Uh, uh, so what does it mean? Uh, without any form of investigation, do not drill. Uh, uh, ultimately, the cables by design are supposed to be at least one inch below the surface, which means technically if you use three quarters of an inch anchor, you'll be safe. Uh, whatever that means in real life, because we all know that nothing in real life is built in accordance to the plans to the extent that you can guarantee that there is not a cable that is less than an inch away from the slab, which means without, without any type of investigation, do not drill in your slab whether it's top or bottom, which means if you're going to drill for a ceiling, for a chandelier or for something like that, you have to do either a GPR, which is a ground penetrating radar, which is going to give you a location of those cables in the slab so you know where to drill, or X-ray, which is far more uh, invasive in terms of uh, requirements uh, how to do it. That same rule applies for installation on something that you're going to anchor at the bottom. Uh, includes shutters, includes uh, frame walls, includes anything like that that you would like to anchor to your floor. Uh, shutter installations or e even window replacements can be notorious for breaking the cables without following these steps uh, for investigation. Simply, uh, you know, by just drilling the slab, 
and thinking if I use three quarter of an inch anchor, I'm good. That's how cables get broken uh, 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 on the on the uh, on the balcony. It should be noted that along that line of the sliding glass doors, the cables are at, at their highest location in the slab, which means they're closest to the top surface. So when you're drilling a hole to uh, 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 anchor the bottom track of your shutter, that's where you're most likely going to break the cable. At that particular location, drilling into the slab above, into the ceiling, you're probably not going to do any harm because cables are on the top surface. So if it's an 18 slab, you could probably drill five inches on the ceiling. Again, at that particular location around the sliding glass doors. However, at the bottom, when you're drilling down, you're most likely going to uh, uh, hit a cable if you don't do any of these investigations. So true or false? This is a question for you, so stay on. True or false? Paint is just superficial. It doesn't protect the building. So it doesn't matter if we haven't painted the building in seven years, 10 years, 15 years, or 20 years. Paint is just cosmetic. Is that true or is that false? Could not be further from the truth. Uh, so that's an absolute uh, uh, incorrect statement. Paint is uh, one of the First of all, paint is the, uh, your, your, your primary protection against weather and against the element. Through uh, quality and, 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 and composition of the paint, that's why we say high build acrylic paints. Uh, Andy was mentioning something, the paints being uh, two, three mils. Those high build paints, they get applied at eight, nine mils and, uh, wet and they dry to six, five, six mils. We have, we have substantial protection in your building. Uh, 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 so. Paint plays uh, an in important integral role of protecting uh, uh, the, the building uh, from weather elements, from rain, sun, uh, a, uh, UV, and so on and so forth. In addition to that, some paints have become so good that if applied uh, at a certain uh, ratios, they can even provide a waterproofing properties to the, to the building. Uh, so uh, paint is absolutely important and I would never underestimate the, uh, you know, the uh, importance of regular painting schedule. You don't know how many times I've heard people say, we're not concerned with the paint right now, um, that it's just superficial, we're going to go ahead and do the parking lot, we're going to go ahead and take care of the pool, we're going to go ahead and get new railings, and they put it off another year and a year and a year. Robert, question for you. How many times, obviously, if, uh, if there's roof damage, you guys are going out there and you're fixing, you know, you're doing, you're doing your thing. Obviously, if there's a window broken, but how many times have you seen just water coming through concrete block where it hasn't been properly waterproofed? That's actually a, a quite a common element that, that we do see, and, and, and especially along the beaches where it's more prevalent and more prominent. But uh, you can pick any high-rise building going down uh, Collins Avenue and, uh, we can definitely find water intrusion coming in from the walls. So I absolutely find uh, waterproofing and painting an absolute necessity and something that should be, be that should be paid attention to as it is warranted and necessary. Kelly or James, what are one of the most common problems when people don't get a project manager involved? At what point should they get a project manager involved on a $5,000 you know, quick repaint of the dumpster corral on a $10,000 project of just the interior hallways on a million dollar roof project? At what point should they have a project manager hired? Well, typically it's, it's, it becomes uh, a more necessary, if you will, for them to hire a project manager when the scope becomes much larger because it becomes much more complicated to manage from an owner's perspective. Um, I, I, don't, I wouldn't necessarily put a dollar value on it. I'd put more of a um, complexity value to it. So if the project is complex, and when I say complex, um, if the client is, is, is having a hard time understanding their needs and wants, developing the scope of work, understanding what the true scope of work is um, to the point where they, they truly know what they need, they truly know what they want, and they also know what they don't want and what they don't need. That's important, right? You want accuracy. So um, I, again, I wouldn't put a dollar value on it. I would just say that 
Um, if you want to have your project managed from a global perspective or from, from, the, from the owner's perspective, getting an owner's rep on board sooner rather than later is the way to go. It's probably one of the first professionals you're going to engage outside of your attorney, right? Because your attorney is going to draft the contract between you and your owner's rep. But the owner's rep is probably one of the first entities you want to bring on board. And that owner's rep is going to help you understand what you need and what you want and, and help you get the proper design professionals on board. Uh, you know, collect those proposals, analyze those proposals, um, help you make a well-informed decision, get the right team in place, and then do the same process with the contractor, right? At the end of the day, you want the best team working on your project for the best value. And, and in my opinion, I'm a little biased, but I'll say it, look, there's, there's, there's no better mechanism in place that could be put in place than a, an association putting an owner's rep right next to them to help them guide them through this process. You're gonna make, you're gonna remove all those unknowns and, and mistakes that you typically make by doing so. Thank you. So we talked about a lot of different paints. First of all, we talked about how to go out to your building and look for spalling, look for little cracks, look for those things. Don't just walk by them and say, oh, that's only an inch big because we don't know how much water is getting in there. So hopefully, you understand how to inspect your building visually. And hopefully now, once you inspect that visually, you know that you have to get the proper representation. Call a contractor, call a lawyer, call a project manager, um, call a w, uh, WRG, call anybody like that. And we talked about a lot of different paints. If you think this technology changes fast, talk to a Sherman Williams. They, their technology and their product line changes literally from week to week. I'm sure Jessica is inundated with all the new products that are constantly coming in. We have this new product and this new ceiling and this and this. And every time I turn around, we can't even keep up. So when I'm on a project and I say, you know what, I'm going to bring the vendor in. It's not because, you know, we don't know what we're doing. We've been doing this for, you know, three generations. It's because there's so many vendors that we deal with paint, um, dry goods, concrete, ceiling, so on and so forth. And they all have new products coming out. So, don't think that you're going to use the same paint that you used 10 years ago or 12 years ago. Get engaged with the manufacturer rep like Jessica, and um, she's probably got something new. Jessica, I know that recently the, the self-cleaning uh, locks on has been a big hit. We've just started applying that. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the, the, self, the locks on self-cleaning? Because I think that's one of my favorite paints right now. Yeah, so um, this is a new technology that we're using. Um, before people were painting and adding some coating just to, to have more protection to the wall. So now we have this paint, this is a technology, it's a self-cleaning product that you can use it in your wall. And um, every time that it rains, like every day here in Florida, right? And the, uh, that dirt, that stick there in the wall that start going out and it's a self-cleaning, it's like, um, having someone watching you all, all the time, every time that it's rain. Um, if you need more information and have a video um, that you can see how the product works, and we can also send your contractor, your painter to, um, to try it on. So we, we're willing to help and to see, and you can see that product um, in one of the on your walls in your property. Yep, thank you. And don't forget about John with Vintium. If you're managing a project, obviously communication is key on every project. They've got the platforms. I've seen them um, in action. And the way that a project can communicate to your entire board and to, and to your, all your residents, um, they, that software really does have a place. Um, Kelly, who won the, uh, the golf ball quiz? Did you write it down? Uh, before I announce, I want to check the videotape because there was some timing and I had a figure in mind that was right and I used other accuracies, but it looks like there's going to be three winners. So um, if you think you won, Kelly at dsscondo.com, send me an email um, and then I will publish on LinkedIn who the actual winners are with a little picture. Excellent. So three winners. You got, I, I got more James money out of them. Excellent. James loves spending money. Rudy. He does a little spending money yes. and taking care of clients. Diana. Rudy, I just wanted to, there was a question, I believe, if we were an insurance um, a law firm, and we are not an insurance claim law firm. I just wanted to make sure I clarified that. We only specialize in 
five construction defects, which is 558 claims, and that's all. We are not a general counsel, legal counsel, uh, insurance claim, law firm, just 558 claims, construction defects only. Thank you. Just wanted to clarify. No, nope, thank you. We're eight minutes to 12 o'clock. Everybody wants to eat lunch, including me. Um, we don't have any more questions. I think we answered a lot of questions while we were kind of going through it. I'd like to thank everybody. Um, please feel free, any of the participants, please feel free to reach out to any of these professionals. If you need their guidance, we're here to help. We're gonna have another class next month on roof coatings. And we're gonna, so if you wanna learn about the fine details on roof coatings, the different types, how to apply, um, we'll send out an email. And uh, yes, you will, Susan, you will be getting CAM credits for this. Um, thank you. In closing, um, have a great day and have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Rudy, you did a great job moderating. Excellent. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Excellent job. Thank you, Rudy. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye, Sunisha. Thank you, guys. Thank, you, Thank you, Rudy. Appreciate it very much. Good day, guys. Thank you. I'm leaving meeting. Um...